Thank you, thank you, thank you. That makes me feel good. Warm applause. Makes everybody feel good. Awesome. Well, we've been talking the last couple times I've spoke about the power of God, and I'm kind of a little bit continuing that theme this morning. Uh, but I've been thinking about um, the manifestation of Jesus in the midst of his church and the centrality of Christ. Like when we come together early, it's all about him. It's, um, it's about Jesus. It's about who he is. It's about our relationship with him. And that he uh, is increasingly manifesting himself. He's making himself known. He's revealing who he is to each one of us and hopefully growing in that aspect of who Christ is. And so uh, to understand that his presence, his manifestation to us is our reward. It's really the, the thing that every place of our heart, everything that we need it's all in him. Like Jesus is the answer. He really is the answer for everything that we need. And so the more that we uh, connect with him, the more that we understand our relationship with him, the more that our life ends up revolving around him, the more the, 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 the deep needs of our heart are satisfied. The deep cries of our heart, the deep things that we're uh, wrestling with, the things that we're struggling with, all the things that we're doing. I have wonderful grandchildren here this morning. I've got five here, and Johnny and Lisa have their, oh, there's the new one there. Give it up here for Annika. <laughs> we're just blessed, blessed, blessed. That's our 13th grandchild. And number 14, their sibling, is got, they're having a little one uh, in a couple, two, three weeks. So hugely blessed. So I, get, I just got this happy moment. It's just like, <laughs> I just felt this happiness coming all over me. Woo! As a Holy Spirit happiness, too. Uh, so much fun. Man, I'm really happy. It's just like, wow. It just hit me. A wave of, of joy just hit me. <laughs> Woo! That's good. Grandchildren are a blessing. Children are a blessing of the Lord. Grandchildren are like, the, I don't know, the whipped cream, the cherry on top, the whatever, the dessert after the meal. I don't know. It's just, they're just incredible they're just fun where was i the centrality of jesus <laughs> he's all wrapped up in all that you know jesus is all wrapped up in your families and all that and so to me what i'm excited about and 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 what i want to talk about is just for us realizing how uh, i don't know it's like sometimes we almost need a uh, to to focus like an auto focus you need to focus your vision your and maybe you're doing great and you're you're kind of all locked in and that some of us, sometimes we can kind of wander or we just kind of get off track. And I just want us to really think about and to focus in on Jesus and who he is. He's, the, again, the answer to every need. He's the satisfaction of our deepest desires. And that uh, Jesus is, um, here's a $2 word, uh, bring, is eminence is a theological word. It means the indwelling Christ. It's the indwelling of who he is in our, so if you want to impress him, he says, well, his eminence. It means that he's dwelling within you. He's in, in our midst. So Jesus said, wherever two or three are, are more are gathered in my name, there I will be in the midst of them. He just was promising, like this morning, right now, Jesus is imminent. He's eminence, not imminent, eminence. I won't try to spell it because I'm not going to go there. You can look it up. Uh, I-M-M-A-N-E-N-C-E. I did it. Eminence. Uh, so he is the center of life in this house, in our church. When we come together, his, who he is as a person is, 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 is he's here together with us when we do that. And so because he's there, anything can happen. Because Jesus is here right now among us, because his presence is here, because he's actually here among us, in the midst of us right now, Jesus can do whatever he wants to do. So we've been talking about power. We've been talking about that. And really his presence and really the essence of revival is the unveiling of Jesus. So when revival comes, pe people all of a sudden have a greater unveiling of Jesus. They actually start meeting Jesus. They start encountering Jesus. We can go back to the, as many of us did in the early 70s and the Jesus people movement and the charismatic movement, Catholic charismatic movement, and all that happened in that time. The whole messianic movement happened in that time. There was an unveiling in that revival there were thousands, probably hundreds of thousands, there were millions in, in terms of the worldwide and certainly in America, millions of young people that were having an unveiling of Jesus. 
they were having, they were seeing Jesus. They were encountering his actual presence. And so it becomes this source of power. It becomes this source of Jesus can heal whoever he wants to heal right now. He's here in our midst. So if your body's hurting, Jesus is here right now. Uh, we could say a prayer for you, but really he's here right now. He could heal you right now. Jesus could feel, fill you with the Holy Spirit. He, the, the power of the Holy Spirit could come upon you right now, and you could be filled with the Holy Spirit. You, could, and have an, you can have an encounter right now because Jesus is here in our midst. He's in the house right now. And so, so we always want to, we never want to lose that focal, focal point. We never want to, to, to get away from, Lord, you are the, the center of our focus. You're the centrality of what we're looking at is Jesus. It's all about him. And so whatever we talk about, whatever we do, ultimately it all needs to come back to him, to him, to, to what he is doing. So Jesus can bring signs and wonders. There's miracles. There's the overthrowing of powers of darkness, the establishing of his righteous government. Deliverance can happen this morning. Um, in fact, is there any, uh, I heard we had an incredible teen camp, youth camp. Uh, anybody, any young people who are at teen camp who want to testify, give a testimony on the spot. Come on, Josh. I knew you, you're, you're a good likely candidate. They had a very powerful time. Had some, uh, uh, well, you go ahead. You tell them about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Um, <laughs> you were there. I wasn't. <laughs> I'm trying to steal go my thunder. Uh, so I went to youth camp. It's, it was my last camp, and I went to youth camp like any other camp I've been to where I thought, this will be fun. And nothing will really change um, because every youth camp I've come back being like, yeah, that was a good experience. And nothing really. Uh, it was, I, I wasn't like a bad kid, so don't think that I just continued the way that I was going. But this camp was a little different. Um, uh, two things that really st stuck out to me was the first one I got, I got prayer over. Um, and I, he was talking about uh, the compassion and caring, and uh, I got the I, Lord broke my heart for like inner city kids and like Chicago. He talked about Chicago and uh, basically the black community and how uh, I I I have a heart for the community that is broken and is ready for God to come and help them. And so it was pretty cool. And then the second thing is a little bigger, uh, but. Uh, when I was eight years old, I was molested by my next door neighbor, mm -hmm. um, and I went through my entire life thinking I can deal with it, um, and so I never got prayer for it. Um, and uh, at camp, it was the first time I ever got prayer for it, and the first time nothing happened, and I didn't feel like it was released or anything like that. Um, but the second time that I got prayer for, uh, I got this feeling of like flying. It was it was one of the most amazing feelings I've ever had in my life, where I felt so light, and I couldn't stop smiling, and I was so happy, and I was on the ground just feeling like, oh, <laughs> it was the craziest feeling I've ever had in my entire life. And I don't know how to explain it, awesome. but it was awesome, and I do feel like I was released from something. And I, I do think it is still a process because that is really big, and there are still things that I struggle with because of it. But it was a step nonetheless, and it was a giant step. So. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Woo. Anybody else? All right, that's awesome. Wow. So he experienced deliverance. He, something, he, uh, something happened, obviously, uh, well, I'm going to try to describe it. Bad. The enemy comes in, and he's in the presence of the Lord. He's in the place where Jesus is, gets prayer, gets set free, gets delivered. So, Lord, right now, I just, this is honestly so rampant in our society. Um, but, Lord, right now, you were testifying about a deliverance, Lord, from sexual abuse and Lord, I just release right now the power of Christ, power of Jesus to bring freedom, to bring deliverance, Lord, to bring people up out of shame, out of guilt, out of self-hatred, 
God, out of all the effects, Lord, that that could happen on their lives right now, Lord Jesus, we just lift up. God, I just lift up, Lord, whoever, God, uh, I know, I'm sure there's many, you know, there's, I'm sure there's a, a number, Lord, that are in this room right now who've experienced this. So, Lord, right now, I just, I begin, Lord, the, the work of deliverance in their heart, their life, if they've not yet experienced that, if they've not yet been able to get ministry or, or help for that, Lord, I just release them now in the name of Jesus, Lord, to begin their process of healing, of restoration, of being set free. God, Josh, Lord, describes this tr tremendous uh, feeling of freedom, of liberty, of just like he's flying. Lord, because he was set free from something. So, Lord, right now we just release the power of deliverance, God. We loose it now in Jesus' name. Well, thank you, uh, Joshua, for being so uh, uh, bold and transparent and honest. I appreciate that a lot. That's awesome. So, really, so the manifestation of Jesus is the center of, of God's power, uh, God's, uh, the, Jesus said that all authority, all power, all dominion has been given unto, the, unto him, and so when Jesus manifests in our midst, his power manifests, his power is made known, it becomes evident, it becomes real, people begins to be touched, and so there's this revealing of the power of God, there's this revealing of uh, what the Lord wants to do, and so it, it's, it's really kind of this, I want to say, uh, a measuring stick, I guess, of our effectiveness is really how much we've encountered and how much we walk in the reality of Jesus. So if I'm in this place of connecting with the Lord, connecting with Jesus, and it's real to me, and I'm experiencing his life, to the degree that I'm experiencing that is really the degree of the authority I'm going to walk in because his authority is what has dominion over powers of darkness. So the more I can encounter him, the more I can experience him, the more I can come into a place where I really uh, have this revelation of who he is and his power, his authority. I come into this place of, of experiencing his miracles, his power, and all the things that he wants to do. So our, and it really it's the same thing within a, in, within a church. The more Jesus manifests within our church, the more miracles we're going to see, the more things are going to happen, the more uh, God's going to move in great way. So our walk with the Lord is not just a form of religion. We're not just doing the routine of religion, but it's li a life centered on a living person, Jesus. It's not mechanical. And so, so often we can, our, our walk with the Lord can just become mechanical. It can be kind of rote. It's like, well, I get up and these are the things I do. Sometimes I don't do things that I should be doing, but I don't do things. And our, our walk with the Lord just becomes mechanical. And what today is we want to talk about, I want us to to realize that Jesus is the center, the focal point of your life. Jesus isn't like a periphery issue. He's not like just a side appendage. It's not like Jesus is just something you will well, have kind of a thought about him once or twice a week. No, Jesus is actually the focal point of your whole life. Your whole life revolves around him. It, the, the Jesus, our, our whole life as a church, it all revolves around him, who he is as a person. And so everything in your life is, I want to say almost is bouncing off Jesus. It's, it's interacting with Jesus. It's, there's this back and forth between who he is and who you are, and there's this continual daily processing life with him. It's not just, oh, I'm just going to show up to church on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, spend a couple hours, and then go do whatever I do, and I'll think about Jesus when I come back a week from now. Or maybe I'll kind of occasionally, you know, once in a while I'll think about him, or I'll read my Bible for a few minutes and kind of think about it. No, your whole life is the focal point of your whole life is Jesus. It's the manifestation of Christ in your life. It's, it's walking with him. It's, it's having this life that's that is with him. So for us, I'm, I'm, we're not just like, sell, as a church, we're not just selling a product. Okay, we're selling Jesus. And so our success will be on how well we mass market Jesus. How well do we advertise? How slick is our promotions? What, is our, what, are, our, what are our giveaways that we have that's going to draw people to him? It, it's, not, it's not just this mechanical, you know, okay, we've got this product and we're trying to sell it. We're trying to make it really slick and, you know, we're going to do all this and we're going to grow. No, we're actually, if we're selling anything, we're selling Jesus. We're selling our relationship with him. We're introducing people to Jesus. We're saying, hey, this is the greatest thing in my life. This is all that my life is centered around. And so when I meet people, at some point, I'm going to introduce them to him, to Jesus, because that's what my life is revolving around. 
It says, when Jesus said, come and follow me, it was an interactive model. When he said, come and follow me, he said, I'm going somewhere. It wasn't like he said, you know what, I'm just going to go around and around and around and around this track, and if you have enough endurance, maybe you can keep up with me because I'm going to keep coming around and around and around this track, and I know you're going to get tired. I know you're going to get, oh, this is kind of boring. No, I want you to just keep coming around this track. No, he said, come and follow me. Like he's on an adventure. He's, he's going somewhere. He's leading us somewhere. And he's saying, I'm going to go somewhere, and you have to keep your eyes on me. Because if you just get diverted for a while, Jesus said, well, I, I'm going here, but you're not focused on him. You're, you're going to lose track. Not that you can't recover and, and refocus and get your eyes back on him. But he's saying, come and follow me. It's this, again, daily interactive experience where I'm listening to him. I'm not just listening to him. I'm, I'm hearing what he's saying. And then I'm not just hearing. I mean internalizing what he's saying. And I'm allowing what he's saying to me to actually change me to become what he's saying to me. And then out of that, I'm walking in obedience. I become that person. And so there's this, there's this daily process of walking with him, hearing his voice, listening to what he's saying, hearing him, internalizing that, and to walk out what he's doing. So there's this reality of our daily walk with Jesus. So there's, Jesus is going to, is, and he is going to do incredible things of the earth. The church is going to be raised up in glory and power. And he's looking basically for people whose lives are centered on him. He's looking for people who are saying, you know what, I want to be part of what you're doing. I, whatever it's, whether it's in your, in your neighborhood or going to another nation, or whatever it is, Jesus is looking for people who will say, yes, Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do what you're calling me to do. And so, again, there's this walking out of your walk, what, what the Lord wants you to do. So I'm going to go to Acts chapter 2. So we look at the church in the book of Acts, and we know the 120 gathered in the upper room. They prayed. Uh, they appointed a 12th apostle to take Judas's place. The Holy Spirit was poured out. And here in the book of Acts, that, that the church in, in Jerusalem becomes, and we'll look at it, becomes this huge church. It becomes a, really, a, in today's terms, becomes a mega church. It just becomes very, very large. And what I want to look at is really from the beginning of this church, all the way through its growth, they never lose the centrality of Jesus. They never stop talking about him. They never stop pointing to him. They never stop preaching him. It's the message of the early church. It's what they are centered on. It's what they do. And so here in, excuse me, in Acts chapter 2, Peter gets up and he's going to give the very first message. He's going to basically explain to all these people what's happened because all these people have been filled with the Holy Spirit. It looks like they're all drunk. This, it attracts this huge crowd. Peter gets up to explain what has happened to these people. He said, these, these people are not drunk as you suppose. He uses the scripture out of Joel to, to talk about this is a fulfillment of what Joel prophesied about 700 years earlier and that they're being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he, in verse 22, he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourself know. What is Paul doing? Excuse me, what is Peter doing? He's pointing to people to Jesus, saying, Hey, this, you're seeing the evidence of what's going on here. And they're saying, Why am I seeing this? Um, I had a, uh, Chris and I, we met with a, a friend of mine from, uh, both Chris, our friend from years and years ago. He actually was part of our wedding. Uh, a guy named Brian Gowan, probably maybe, might be a few of you who know him. He's been down in Houston for probably the last 30 years. And uh, he is one of the, he's really the main guy in Houston who has connected all the churches. He's really into transformation, into the George Otis things. And he has really led really a move of unity in the churches in the city's, uh, city of Houston. And he's very connected to a lot of the mega church. Like in Texas, all the churches are big pretty much. I mean, they're just big churches. They're huge churches. So he's very connected to a lot of the leaders of these large churches. He was telling us he, he has the most amazing 
testimonies and stories. He was telling us all these things that the Lord had been doing down in Houston. And he's worked, he works with one, of, with one of the largest hospitals in Houston. He's a chaplain and seen miracles all the time. Uh, but he was talking about, he was having a conversation with one of the pastors of one of the mega churches there in Houston. And the church was celebrating one of their anniversary, whatever number it was, 25, 30 years, whatever it was. And so people were relating the stories of their church about all the things that God had, had done in their church there in Houston, this mega church. And the pastors of the church, his comment was after everybody, everybody got done sharing, he says, it, says, it can, actually kind of made him sad because our story doesn't look like the book of Acts. Like it, it, when we look at the history of our church, it's not, it's not Acts, it's something else. I want the book of Acts. I want the power of God. I want the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I want Jesus to be manifested and the power of God to happen. So when these powerful things happen, people say, well, what is all this about? You Then at that point, you point them to Jesus. Somebody's healed. Somebody's delivered. Somebody, you know, something great happens to them. You pray for something, and they feel some presence on them. And they're saying, what is this? You say, it's about Jesus. So Peter gets up, and he says, this man Jesus that you, you know, you've heard about, or you, you, you witnessed yourself, he, they're pointing to Jesus. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the li- hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Then he goes through David. He uses a scripture um, that David, one of his psalms that he had. Um, verse 31, for he, he, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, of that we are all his witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Again, he just goes through and talks about the Lord. Verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what? Receiving Christ, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit are obviously connected. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are, are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And so he says, uh, those who received his word were baptized, and they were at it that day about 3,000 souls. I believe that when Jesus is manifest, that anything is possible. So here, for the very first day, the power of the Holy Spirit's poured out, Jesus stands up, gives a message about Jesus, pointing everybody to relationship with him. On that day, 3,000 people are added to the church. That can happen right now. It can happen today. (laughs) That can happen right now. It can happen today. That can happen right now, today. The manifestation of Jesus can come. The power of the Holy Spirit can come. All of a sudden, something triggers in the spirit, and there can be a great, great influx of people, not just into this church, but into the church as a whole. That, when we're saying, okay, that when Jesus is being manifested, when he is being revealed in the earth, one of the things he's going to do, he's going to draw people to him. If I be lifted up, I will what? I will draw all men to me. And so as we're lifting Jesus up, as we're making him the focal point of our lives, we shouldn't be shocked when people want to come to him. When we're talking about him, when he's the focal point of our lives, when our lives are revolving and we're lifting him up, the result of that is that he's going to draw all men to himself. If he's not being lifted up, then people aren't going to come. But if he is being lifted up, if he is the focal point, if he is the thing that are centering our life around, we should expect that God is going to draw the Holy... No one comes to the Father except the Spirit draws him. We should expect the Holy Spirit to draw people to us because we are the ones who are lifting Jesus up. So we, we shouldn't be shocked when somebody comes and they actually, you can tell they've got a question, they've got a thought, they've got something that they're struggling with. It's because our hearts and our lives and our, our, our minds, our whole life is centered around Jesus that when that happens, God will draw people to us, and we need to, then what do we do? We just point them to Jesus. 
We just talk about him. We begin to relate to people about the things that he wants to do. So there's this thing of revival that happens. So Jesus becomes the focal point of Jesus' preaching. Then, then our Acts 2.42 happens. They devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. And then all this favor comes on the people. All the, the, the sense of awe and wonder is coming on the people. So again, in chapter 3, Peter and John, they're going to the temple at the hour of prayer. There's a man who is lame from birth who is being, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple. That's called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those who enter the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. Peter directed his gaze at him, and he, as did John, and, said, and Peter said to the man, Look at us. And the man fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. I don't have silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. This, and so in that moment, he... Peter took him by the hand, he raised him up, he was leaping, he was praising, he was worshiping, he was, you know, going crazy. It says later on in, in chapter 4 that he was over 40 years old. So this man was lame from birth. He had been at that gate maybe since he was a boy, and that's where he was living, is in this condition of utter dependency upon people's charity, upon their, their pity, and all that they, that they were giving him. And all of a sudden, he has this encounter. He sees Peter and John. He looks at them, says, you know, basically asking for money. Peter says, I don't have any money, but what I do have. You have something. I have something to give people. You have Jesus to give people. How Jesus wants to manifest himself is up to him, but you do have something. He said, well, I don't, you know, and we all run into this. We see people, and you kind of go, ah, you know, you, we, I don't, you go kind of, maybe you don't do it, what, kind of go through this guilt cycle, like, ah, should I give, should I not give? You know, Lord, what do you want to do? And, you know, you kind of, then you, I don't know, you go through all this stuff, and then you drive by, and you're done, and <laughs> I don't know. Maybe occasionally you, you stop, and you do something, and, uh, but t to realize, again, if my life is, is centered around Jesus, that when I'm, uh, when I'm face to face with the need, I do have something to give them. I do have something to give those people. You're not empty handed. You're, like you go to the cupboard, your cupboards aren't bare. You actually have Jesus inside of you to give to somebody. Jesus can manifest his power. He can raise that person up. And honestly, this guy had been there for 40 years. I think everybody who'd gone to the temple, everybody knew him. Like he was just a, a fixture, like, Everybody knew the blind, the, this crippled beggar who'd been there for 40 years. Sometimes we think we, we are face-to-face -face with long-term problems, long-term situations like, ah, you know, people have been trying to help this guy for 40 years. Nothing's ever happened. Why would today be any different? We all, we just, we just be, well, yeah, he didn't just have an accident last week and he got crippled. He's been crippled for 40 years, more than 40 years. So that we have to say, Lord, when I have Jesus, I actually have the power to change things that are long-term problems, long-term uh, realities. Would be good. This has been their reality for over 40 years. I have the power in Christ to change something that's been there for many, many years. We think, well, this is the way our nation's been for 40 years. This is the way our school system's been for 40, 50 years. We have the power to change these situations. We have Christ within us, the manifestation of power. When our lives are focused on him, they're revolving around him, we have the power to change these things. Faith in his name. So they were, uh, he rises, he, he was, uh, you know, praising God, doing all those things. Uh, down in verse, um, they basically kind of, what shall we do? Uh, Peter says, repent, therefore, turn again that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. What happens? When we turn to the Lord, what happens? Times of refreshing come. The more you turn to the Lord, 
the more you're going to experience his presence. The more your heart turns to him, the more he becomes your focal point, the more you experience that, the more you're going to experience his presence, his power, the refreshing of the Lord. And guess what? The more you're going to be able to release, you're going to see the signs and wonders, the demonstrations of power. You're going to see the impact of your life and what you want to do. So our turning to him becomes the vehicle, becomes the, the process where we experience more of his power, the things that the Lord wants to do. We begin to, begin to experience really the, the move of the Holy Spirit in a powerful way. I honestly believe we're experiencing a measure of revival, and I've said this before and said a lot of people. I honestly feel like the measure of what we're experiencing right now is probably, talk about Ezekiel and the measure of the, the, the river being ankle deep and knee deep and waist deep and then waters to swim in. I feel that we're in kind of waist deep water right now. We're, we got plenty of water to splash, to feel the presence of the Lord, to be touched, to be happy. But I believe that where really the water level is rising and we're going to experience more and more of Christ because Jesus is manifesting himself right now in our lives and in our midst. where he is, he is coming and he's manifesting. He's revealing himself in power and in might. So Acts chapter 4, um, we'll go to verse, verse 4, Acts 4, 4. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men, so this is just the men, the number of the men came to about 5,000. So this is after they had healed the man, so they went from 3,000, and whether that was 3,000 men or 3,000 people, from 3,000 to 5,000 men within a fairly short amount of time. This one miracle of the lame beggar who had been lame like that for 40 years, that one miracle was what caused the church to grow from 3,000 people to 5,000. But 5,000 men, you've got to figure there's an equal number of women. Throw in a couple of children for all the men. You probably at that point have a ch church of 20,000 people in Jerusalem in a fairly short amount of time. <laughs> One miracle, one manifestation of Jesus, let me put it that way, can completely change your life, complete, can change the life of this church. When we're focused on him and we're expecting him to do signs and wonders, to do miracle power, we don't realize how radical and how quickly our lives in a church can change in that mode, in that operation. It becomes this potential for explosive growth. It becomes this place where God can move tremendously with power. So there's this church of at least 20,000 people. And they get before the Sanhedrin. They're asking him all these questions. Peter is, again, filled with the Holy Spirit in verse 8, begins to preach to them, talk to them about who Christ is. Verse 13 I'll go to verse 12. And, then, and there's salvation and no, no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So he's, again, he's talking to them about Jesus. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. So this mark of just being with Jesus, they were fishermen, a tax collector, just an ordinary guy. They'd been with Jesus and they were, they were all of a sudden these people who were shaking Jerusalem. They weren't just shaking Jerusalem. They were shaking the very power structure of the city. These guys who were uneducated, common men, were shaking because the whole Sanhedrin was really the ruling, you know, the Roman government, the civil government, and you had the religious sphere. The Sanhedrin was, was uh, basically controlling, ruling the city of Jerusalem. These 12 uneducated, mainly you know, fishermen, common kind of guys, because they had been with Jesus, because their lives had centered around Jesus, they were shaking the power structure of their whole city. That's what, our, what, what God wants us to do. When the power and uh, our life, uh, what Jesus wants to do in our lives, when he begins to manifest in our lives, we can begin to, to shake and to overthrow power structures governmentally over cities. It's, these are just 12 guys, ordinary guys, they were uneducated. They didn't have PhDs. They didn't have theolo theological degrees. They didn't, you know, they really, they probably had some knowledge of the Scripture, but they were not like the Pharisees. They weren't like the Apostle Paul. They were not highly trained. But they'd been with Jesus, and they began to shake the power structure of their city. We, 
we can do that, church. We can be people who are just common people, but because we're with Jesus, we can begin to shake things in a powerful way. So he goes on, he talks about um, basically testifying to all the things that God had done. So in verse 23, they released him. Uh, they tell him, you know, don't say anything any longer, but they're going to go out and they're going to proclaim that. Uh, they heard that they lifted up their voices to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. Uh, they, they said the rulers have set themselves against. He's quoting Psalm 2 now. And then he says, verse 29, And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand as heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. You stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So there, and when they had prayed, the place in which they had gathered, it was together, was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So this was after an, a, a second infilling or a subsequent infilling to what happened in Acts chapter 2. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So we can come into this place, say, Lord, we want our lives to be centered around you. We can experience a significant miracle and miracles in our midst. And then it doesn't have to stop there. We can continue to experience the power of God. We can continue to experience actually a greater infilling, a greater empowerment. So there's this progressive empowering. There's this thing. And he says, Lord, fill our mouths with boldness. And to speak the word of God with boldness, that's what signs and wonders, miracles might be done through the, to your, the, the, son, the hand of your son Jesus. So then we can begin to experience greater and greater miracles and power and wonders, the things that he wants to do. You stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. When they had prayed, the place in which they had gathered together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. And so there was this great demonstration of the power of God. We've been talking about community, going back to John Neese's word and other things that we've been talking about, uh, kind of uh, expanding our Acts 242 groups. So verse 32 says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. What? There was tremendous unity. No one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. So it just, it's, getting, it's very radical at this point where the Lord is pouring out his spirit. He's pouring out his power on the people. People are being filled with love for one another, becoming one in heart and soul. And then it says, With great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Great power and great grace. Great power and great grace. Great power and great grace. Lord, we just release great power and great grace. Great power and great grace. When Jesus begins to manifest in our midst, great power can come and great grace can come. We can begin to be transformed with great power and great grace in signs and wonders and miracles can happen in this place and in our lives throughout our, through all the things that we're doing. There can be great power and great grace. Then it says, There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of land or houses sold them. Again, this is the New Testament example of giving. And it was all voluntarily. It was all pe through people's hearts, what they wanted to do. But this is what they did. They, they had lands or houses. They sold them, brought the proceeds of what they sold, laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Bar Barnabas, which means sons of encouragers, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So there's this tremendous outpouring of community. So there's this outpouring of power, of signs and wonders and miracles, and there's this great outpouring of community. There's this deep love. There's this deep caring. There's this generosity. There's this... Uh, like, hey, I don't need this. I'm just going to give you whatever I don't need. I, whatever is excess in my life, I'm just going to bring it in, and we're just going to make sure that nobody has any need. We're just going to do that. That was the reality of what God wants to live in. That's the reality of what I want to see in my life, and I want to see in this house. Not that we're going to force people to sell things or make you do stuff, but it's this, you're under the compulsion of the Holy Spirit. It just comes on you, and all of a sudden, you're moved with great power. 
you're moved with great grace. You're moved with great love and compassion for other people. And all of a sudden, God starts to move, and there starts to be miracles and signs and wonders, and things happen in our hearts and our lives that are amazing. And I, honestly, I believe that, so I believe, I, I, it's more than, I want to say it's faith. It's, for me right now, it's a knowing that Jesus is manifesting himself right now. He's, is the, the degree of his revealing himself to us is increasing. The, the, he's, in, he's increasingly showing himself in greater and greater measures who he is, and we're going to encounter that, who he is, and there's going to be a release of tremendous power and miracles in our midst. This is, I don't know what other path you want to take. I don't know what other, other alternative you want to do. I mean, it's either do the merry-go-round and just go round and round and round in a religious rut for 10, 20 years, 30 years, and just, you know, that's pretty, that's really boring. You can do the corporate slick model and just get a really nice advertising campaign cranked up, you know, and I'm not trying to diss other people or churches that way. I mean, that's an option because we, we want to do things. We don't want to offend anybody that comes in. We don't want to, we don't want to make it too crazy, too radical. You know, that's an option. I mean, that's what people, you can choose to do that or you can choose this option. You can choose the book of Acts and say, this is what God wants to do. He wants our lives to actually focus on Jesus, for him to be the center of our whole life, for everything that is in our lives to revolve and to, uh, to I say, bounce off of him, to interact with him, to come and follow me, is to have this walk with him, and to walk this life that's filled with greater and greater adventure, greater power, greater miracles, greater signs and wonders, greater demonstrations of what he wants to do. That is what I'm proposing the Lord is wanting to take us on. That's the adventure that he's leading us on, is our willingness to say, Lord, we want to be a people who will individually and corporately follow you, that our eyes are fixed on you, and we're walking with you. We're anticipating you to move with power and might in our midst and to see great signs and wonders happen in our midst. That's what I want. That's what I, that, that's what I want to go for is this, this all-in, all-out, all access, just l moving into the things, the power, the things that God wants us to do. I'm not, I don't want to water it down. I don't want to make it more palatable for somebody. I, you know, I don't want to just be weird and shocking for that sake, you know, for that whatever, weirdness sake. But I do want the power of the Holy Spirit. I do want the manifestation of Jesus in this house to come and to see him move with great power and signs and wonders. So, Lord, right now, we're just saying yes to you, Lord. We're saying that, Jesus, you are everything in my life, in my family's life, in this church's life, in the life of this city. Lord, we put you at the center of all that we're doing. We exalt you, Jesus. We exalt your work in our life. We exalt the things that you're saying to us. Lord, we take those things. We internalize them. We allow them to change us. And, Lord, we become like you. We become your nature in us. And, Lord, when we do that, you're going to draw all men to us. You're going to draw people to us, Lord. Lord, I believe that with all my heart, that as we exalt you, you're going to draw people to us right now. You're going to draw people to our lives out there, and you're going to draw people in here, God. You're going to move with power and might. Lord, I believe, God, that we're going to see greater signs, greater wonders, greater miracles, greater demonstrations of your power. So, Lord, right now, we just release power of God right now. Lord, he says, all together they were praying, and they were saying, God, fill us with your Holy Spirit that we could speak your word with boldness. So, God, release boldness into our mouths, into our hearts, God, into our voices, God. Lord, break every fear, God, of man that would want to thwart and to stop and diminish our voices, God. Lord, release the power of the Holy Spirit right now. Release the manifested, resurrected Christ right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, fill this place with the power of Christ. Fill this place, God. Let this place be shaken, God. Let this place be shaken in the name of Jesus. God, shake this place, God. Shake it, God. 
with the power of God. Shake it now in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I believe that your kingdom is going to explode in this house, in this city, in our nation, God. And you're looking for available vessels, God. You're looking for vessels that are all in, that are co totally committed, Lord, to walking with you, to doing what you've told them to do, God. Lord, we would lose people right now to walk with you, Jesus, to do what you've called them to do, God. Lord, to step out with courage and boldness, God, with bravery, God, and to extend their hands, God, and to release miracles and signs and wonders in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we loose it now in the name of Jesus. Lord, you're raising up, God, your apostolic church, God, that is being sent out, God, to do the work of the kingdom, God. You're empowering us, God. You're empowering us with great power and great grace, God. Great power and great grace and great love, God. Great generosity, God. You're empowering us now, God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, God. God, we call, Lord, in the harvest in Jesus' name. God, as we lift up Jesus Christ, Lord, we believe that the harvest is coming, is at the door, and it's coming. We open our hearts, God, to receive the harvest, God, whether it's in our workplace or out there somewhere, God, or in here, wherever it comes, God. Lord, we say, God, you're going to bring the harvest in, God. You're going to demonstrate power right now in the name of Jesus Christ. God, let notable miracles happen now in the name of Jesus. Notable miracles, God. Lord, even miracles that come on the news, God. Lord, that are broadcast on our news networks, God. Notable miracles, God. Lord, situations that have been long-term, God. Lord, even 40-plus years, God, have are been long-term, God. Let notable miracles happen now in the name of Jesus, God. Lord, we want to be that Acts Church, God. Lord, and be all that you're calling us to be, God. Lord, come now in the power of the Holy Spirit. Come now like the book of Acts, God. Come now and fill us, God. Come now and let fire come upon us, God. Come now and fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit, God. Thank you, God. Stir us with hunger. Stir us with boldness, God. Stir us with the fire of God in our hands, in our feet, God. Stir us with fire right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God, I break every power of hell, God that wants to hold back your church, God. I take dominion and authority, God. I break it now in the name of Jesus Christ. I break every limiting spirit in the name of Jesus. Lord, we set your people free now. We set everyone free in the name of Jesus, God, to walk in the fullness of who you call them to be, God. Miracles, signs and wonders, healing, God, salvation, God, deliverance, Jesus. Lord, we loose it now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Increase, Lord. Multiplication, God. I declare increase in the name of Jesus. Multiplication, Jesus. Lord, I loose it now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Lord, even as they hit 5,000 men, Lord, and later it says they continue to increase in several places, God, the church continues to grow, God. Lord, we just loose ourselves into an upward trajectory, God. I release this church into an upward tra trajectory, God. Multiplication, God. Increase. God, fullness, God. God, transformation, Lord, of our city. Transformation of Spokane, God. Transformation of Spokane, Lord, into the fullness of what you want this city to be. In Jesus' name. A light, a beacon, God, of light, Lord, to the nation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Ordinary people, God. Just ordinary people, God. Shaking the power structures of their city. Ordinary people, God. Ordinary men and women, God. Shaking the power structures of their city, God. Lord, put it in our spirit. Put it in our spirit right now. Ordinary, God. Just regular men and women, God, who made Jesus the focal point of their life. We're shaking the power structures of their city. God, we loose it. I loose it now in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Thank you, Lord, an empowering spirit right now. God, to shake the power structures of our city. Thank you, Lord. Economic God, governmental Lord, spiritual Lord. We loose it now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Amen. So do you want that? <laughs> I mean, it's pretty simple, right? Um, I think that the, the couple points I just want to um, highlight is the community piece. When we operate as one body, God does awesome things through that. And, uh, um, you know, last uh, Thursday, I think I, I read that 1,500 people were saved at the Franklin Graham thing, at least 1,500 people. So, you know, God's moving and things are happening. And... Uh, and I want what John's pre preaching about. Xavier and I are sitting there, and she starts yelling out. I don't know if you heard her. She's like, yeah, you know, a couple of times. Because that's what we're after. You know, we want to see uh, God's kingdom move. And I know you guys too do as well. So um, let's see it happen. You know, watch for your opportunities. And just as we make God our focal point, you know, that's where it comes from. And so if we're seeking him, all of a sudden everything that is going on around you is centered on him. So let's do that. So, Lord, we just thank you for today, God. God, we thank you, Lord. We want to be uh, just observant of what you're doing. And, Lord, uh, let us have a tunnel vision focused on you um, in Jesus' name. If you want prayer, there's going to be some people up here that can pray with you. Um, and otherwise, have a blessed week, and we'll see you soon.